All right, Herp House Rock, we have a really exciting podcast for you tonight. We have the one and only Bob Applegate. Um, he's an expert in the community, uh, in the hobby, in the industry. He's been doing this for a long time. And uh, I don't think he's ever been on a podcast before. And uh, hopefully, we're the first one. So uh, we want to capture all of this information. So you guys got to stay tuned for this one. Okay. Awesome. All right. I do oh, take Bob, issue with a with the term expert though. Because what's Bob. a spurt? That's a drop of water under pressure, and X is you used to be. <laughs> oh, I can see how this is gonna be. <laughs> well, Bob, honestly, um, you know, your name has come up a good bit since we started doing this and we asked for recommendations. I've even run into people at Oklahoma reptile shows that have brought you up. Um, anyone who has a milk snake on their table should know who Bob Applegate is. Um, but yeah, Bob, you've had a great career in the industry. Um, you're a talker, bud. Let's start from wherever you want. If you want to go early days, whatever makes you happy, man, you got a great story. Let's hear it. Well, I was born at a very young age and started from there. Somewhere around five, I caught my first snake and my parents were terrified of it. So I was allowed to keep it in a a coffee can underneath the house and it got loose the first night and was gone and I was broken hearted. So my dad made me a little plastic cage and actually made me go to the library and read books about snakes so that uh, it turned out to be an educational thing. Uh, my grades improved because my reading improved and um, started bringing snakes home. And by the time I was 10 years old, uh, my parents had been acclimated to the point where I had a six foot boa running loose in the room and about 70 snakes in cages along the walls. And back in those days, it was just a collection. You didn't really breed or anything. But um, <clears throat> at some point, I decided I wanted to get into some of the foreign stuff. And so I, I would start collecting commercially and then trading my animals to some of the dealers for you know, some of the more exotic stuff. And then, you know, like African boas and things like that. And then I got to the point where I was also very cheap because we were growing up rather poor. And so I thought, well, these guys are making a fortune off the snakes I'm trading. And maybe I should just import directly. And so I'd, I'd bring in 20 of something. Like I, I used to deal with uh, um, J.H.E. Leakey, the son of the explorer that found the prehistoric woman or whatever that was, Lucy. Uh, I used to buy cobras and pythons and things from him, and I'd bring in 20 or so, and then I'd want to sell them to get some of my money back. But a lot of my friends were poor too, so they were start, starting to trade snakes to me for them. So now I was suddenly the guy that I was avoiding, and so I ended up having to commercially sell those. So I don't know. I just just kind of went on and on and on. And then some of the first breedings were accidents. You'd acquire something, grab it, and try to figure out how to hatch them. And back in those days, you'd call I'd call the San Diego Zoo. And oh, reptiles can't be bred in captivity. And uh, if if you put them in a crock with damp sand and put a piece of glass over it, maybe you'll get lucky and they'll hatch. And, I mean, that didn't set too well, so we had to start learning how to do this stuff. And I figured, gee, they lay eggs in the wild. It can't be that tough to hatch them in captivity. And so I ended up, um, we had a uh, an oven that had a pilot light on it, and the cabinet above it was kept warm by this pilot light all the time. And so I found that if I put the eggs up there to where they were warm, um, you know, most of them 60 days, some of them longer and some of them shorter, would start hatching. And that worked great until my wife cooked something once and overheated the cabinet and killed that year's worth of eggs. And then the Argentine boas bred by accident and the Gila monsters bred and beaded lizards bred. And pretty soon I was breeding all sorts of stuff. And then I decided to specialize in something that would give me a little vacation. So I went strictly into the colubrids because you could hibernate them for a few months and actually do something besides shoveling snake shit and feeding mice. And um, here we are. 
There you go. Um, only only well, covered just, about 60 years. Okay, I was going to say, so um, I know in the article I read said that you were breeding the Argentine boas in the late 1970s. Yeah, I think it was 77 and 78. We accidentally had some clutches. Uh, back in those days, we had a snake room that everybody said, in fact, if you let them get cool, they got mouth rot, and you're always having problems with it. And so <clears throat> in 1970, I finally bought my first house and decided I was going to convert the garage into a reptile room. Well, the city wouldn't let me enclose the garage, so I built a 10 by 17 room inside the garage where there was just barely enough room for the garage door to open. And there was, well, you could go into the room, but the outer wall were glass cages and the Argentine boas had the corner cage. And then the row of cages underneath had lights shining on them that were hung on the bottom of the upper cage. So these snakes could lay above the lights and be as warm as they wanted or they could crawl forward to the glass front and lay up there and be cool. So they actually modulated their own temperatures. And suddenly I started getting clutches of Argentine boas <clears throat> and I had gotten these animals. They had changed hands at least twice and people gave up as they're unbreedable. I had a trio of them. They were very large. Um, then I got greedy and a guy called me and said, well, I've got a female Argentine boa that only eats chicks, but add it to your colony because we're going to, you know, get rich. I mean, I was getting $150 each for them back when the house payment was $140. So you can imagine, uh, I think there was a clutch of 23 and a clutch of 25, the first two. So we had 48 of these things. So by standards back in the 70s, I was rich. Uh oh, got a new guy. Hey, hey, oh, just, sorry, guys. He just changed places with me. <clears throat> but so anyway, I got this boa sent to me and it was skinny as hell and i used to bring in baby chicks every week to feed some of the other stuff i had and um but i back in those days we didn't quarantine anything i mean you had wild snakes from all over the world together in the room so i put it in with my breeding colony and it died within two weeks followed by two gravid females followed by the male followed by all the babies that i was raising in different cages so how did that end up? My friend was mad at me for killing his boa. <laughs> of course he was. Why wouldn't he be? But that was the Argentine boa story. Oh, uh, yeah. So 40 years ago, tell us about how you found customers. Like, you know, I know the early days of Jeff Ronnie, he would send out VHS tapes with different boa constrictors on it. Oh, this what was, was way it? before was it? that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you were way, way before that. Um, well, well, I'm, well, I'm 75 like years old, and I started when I was six. So let's let's do some addition and mathematics here. Yeah, that was. But, uh, I'm not going to say there weren't VHS tapes back then, but I know there weren't VHS tapes back then. No, there weren't. But basically, uh, we could add, we could advertise in the the local newspapers, and then I used to actually send out a price list every year. I just um, get a mailing list, and I'd send out a price list, and and back then you could mail snakes to people and. And um, just a lot of people locally would show up. You know, we had the San Diego Herpetological Society got started way back then. And, uh, met quite a few people through them. And, and I had a friend of mine that owned a pet shop. And once in a while, I'd take one of my big pythons in and sit in the front window to uh, get attention for him. And, and uh, just just networking, basically. Okay. Um Tell us about some of the unique species you were able to get in the country in the early days, because I, you know, you've got a lot of stuff in from what I've heard <clears> over the years. Well, I, I ran into a guy. Oh, another another way I used to meet people that I would uh, import stuff from is I would just send letters to universities and say, "Is there anybody in your biology department that would be interested in exchanging reptiles?" And I ended up meeting a guy in the Solomon Islands who was some kind of a agriculture inspector that flew from island to island and so he gathered up all kinds of stuff so i got solomon island skinks and the solomon island boas and all sorts of weird little frogs and weird little lizards and he'd, he'd send me stuff and say do you think you can sell these and i had a guy from salon that uh, his father was some kind of uh, important thing so he could bypass all the protection rules and get the indian light phase pythons but back then the Burmese pythons from Marnaj Lok Chai in Thailand were 
three dollars each. So why would and they were prettier? Why would why would you want an Indian light face python or a Selenese python when a Burmese was a lot prettier? Three ticks were a buck and a half each. Um, you could buy cobras for $2. Uh, the uh, rough and smooth uh, sand boas were two, three dollars each. Um, the um, Jackson's chameleons, the big ones, the Mount Kenya form, buck and a half. The small ones, and that's a dollar and a half, not 150. And the small ones were 90 cents. <clears throat> I met a guy in Marie, or I didn't meet him, but I uh, acquired information from a guy in Mauritius and used to get those little. Little um, Elsuma sepidiana, the little um, geckos, the little bright green ones with the red marks on them and everything. Probably about six inches long. <clears throat> he used to send them in the typical aquarium styrofoam box, you know, fish shipping things. But what he would do is he cut a little hole in the top and then he'd put a hundred of them in there and then tape the thing shut. Well, when you went through customs in Los Angeles, they insisted on looking in there and when you open a box with a hundred of those little geckos there's probably still some of them living in the warehouse up there because they just sort of scrambled or <clears throat> i remember i imported a hundred of the uh toke geckos once and they would come in a, a wooden frame with like a pillowcase stapled over top of it and i remember i was unpacking them i was ripping the thing open and i'd reach in and i'd grab one and put it out and my, my non-reptile neighbor was coming by and he, hey, what you doing? Well, that looks fun. Can I help? I said, well, sure. You know, there's another bag full of them over there if you want to unload them and put 10 for aquarium. So he didn't think anything of it. I, he ripped the thing open and he put his arm in all the way in. I, er, 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 and he's come out and he's got them hanging from him and he's an animated guy anyway. And several of them were living in my garage for a long time after that. But we've, we've had fun. He was a little, kind of a chubby guy, and I took him out in the desert and watching him crawl up to a little gecko and try to grab it, and it would run a little bit, and then he'd crawl a little bit and run a little bit. And I, I'm glad I was stopped because I was laughing so hard, I don't think I could have controlled the vehicle at that point. But, no, it's just been fun. I mean, it's I never expected to make any money at it. It was just, in fact, when I... Well, basically, I was poking fun at my girlfriend in high school, and she took me seriously. So I was a father six days after I was 19. So it kind of ended my college career. But I was thinking, what occupation could I get into where I have a day off or days off? Well, I could be a school teacher. Yeah, crap. That takes six years of college, and no way I can get through that. How about a fireman? They're off every other day. And get good vacation. So I'll be a fireman so I can play snakes on my day off. And ended up where the snakes made more money eventually than the fire department did. That but it, I didn't right. go into it before that. <clears throat> it just happened that I lived on the fire department income and invested the snake income and, <clears throat> and gradually you got to the point where, you know, I invested more snakes, but eventually you got to the point where, hey, this is all I can handle. So then I started buying houses because I was in a tracked home and my neighbors once in a while would complain. So once I got a little more money, I started buying the houses around me so I could evict anybody that gave me any crap. So, <clears throat> so I had three houses around me and then I was convinced to buy this place out in the country. <clears throat> so, and that was in uh, 1992. And so I've got 15 acres that I love it out here. I got a, <clears throat> leaning up against the back wall. I have a 12 gauge shotgun and a 22 semi-automatic and depending on what goes by depends on what caliber I use. <clears throat> but we do, we're close to the border and I thank Trump for his wall, but we used to have the Mexicans come through on a fairly regular basis. And I mean, you know, a lot of them are good, hardworking people. I have nothing against them, but when they come through and they leave the gate open and your animals get out or <clears throat> they'll go into the well house and they'll want to try to get water and they'll turn the spigots on. And if the pump isn't going, nothing comes out, but they don't shut it off. And then when it kicks on, it floods the place. So one morning a neighbor called and said, there's 21 Mexicans coming through your fence. I said, well, how do you know there was 21 of them? I said, well, I counted them, but don't worry. Board I called border patrol already. They should be on their way. Well, we had company probably, I don't know, 
a couple hours later, we're sitting at the table and I'm looking down in the brush that's, you know, surrounding the, the pad of the house. And I see a hat moving through the brush. I, I just jokingly said, well, I think I'm going to take a shot at that one to move them along. My friend stood up and looked a little closer and he said, I wouldn't shoot at that one. It's wearing a badge. So two hours later, they were tracking the Mexicans through my property. <clears throat> but it's How fun out it? here. It's fun. Yeah, it sounds like a little bit of everything out there. Yeah. Bob, I, I just want to say real quick. So one of the things about this podcast is when one person's talking, if somebody makes a noise, it kind of cuts out other stuff. And you're saying some really funny things, and I'm holding in my laughter. So <laughs> – um, I know that Ryan and Dave are the same way. We're, well, so don't feel like your jokes aren't uh, – or what you're saying isn't funny or, or catching you to laugh or anything. It is hilarious, some of the stuff. I'm listening well, to what you're saying, and I'm watching the faces of everybody else on here, and everybody's just like slack-jawed like, what the heck? <laughs> other people out here too? <laughs> it's great. You're, you're great. Uh, um, I try to have fun. I mean – the, the world's too serious these days. Or some of the times and, when I've been arrested, they don't seem to appreciate my humor. <laughs> uh, you know, got to do their job. Um, well, what the heck is it, Bob? Uh, so you've also been able to travel the world for this, right? Yeah, I've been to a few places. Um, actually, it was fun. They, they flew me over to England to do a give a talk to the all royal something or another there's about 500 people there but i decided i'd stop in germany on the way because i had to smuggle 248 snakes in and so i had them all packed into my luggage and everything and and uh, but i had paperwork to bring them into england so i thought if i got caught i'd if some of them were going to be dropped off in germany and then some of them were going on to england i figured if i got caught um, I could just show them the paperwork and say they're in transit, you know, they're just going through, but didn't get caught. So, so we delivered a whole bunch of stuff. I, I wasn't real good with my geography though, because I had to get to England. The only, the only part of my trip that I didn't plan because, you know, I thought England was close to Germany. And so I figured I'd fly into Germany and be there for a while. And then I had my flight home from England back to the United States but I didn't know how I was going to get to from Germany to England. And so I, I thought there was a bridge or you could take a cab or something. Well, <laughs> to, to get on an airplane and go up and then down was 300 bucks and the whole, everything else was about 600 bucks to fly around the world. So I learned the hard way that even though, you know, I mean, during the war, they're talking about flying these buzz bombs over and all that stuff. I thought there had to, ferry or something but apparently you got to fly so and, and and in case you didn't know it england's an island yeah, i heard that i actually knew that i don't know a lot <laughs> but i knew that <laughs> so what did you talk about with your with the uh, group of royals well <clears throat> i felt underdressed so i had a t-shirt with a tuxedo on it and i wore that as i was giving the talk because I figured, you know, hey, this is a royalty thing, and I got to look important. <clears throat> and um, so basically there was 500 or so people in the auditorium, and I put together a slideshow that, that um, kind of covered hunting here locally and a trip down into Mexico and the captive breeding. And I mean, everybody else that was at the place had about half an hour to an hour to give a talk. They gave me three hours, and then when I was done, they – Hey, mate, you want a glass of water? And can you answer some questions? I was there another hour or two answering questions. So, <clears throat> But another thing, when you go to England and you order iced tea, they look at you rather funny because I was at this restaurant with a whole bunch of people. And by the way, don't eat the Indian food. That stuff is hot. But uh, <laughs> <clears throat> we're, at this, we're at this restaurant, and I like iced tea. So I, I asked the proper gentleman, I says, could I order some iced tea? And he said, well, sir, we, we don't have any iced tea. I said, well, do you have ice? Of course, sir, it's a civilized country. Do you have tea? This is England, of course we have tea. I said, bring me some of each and some sugar, I'll make it here. And I made my iced tea on the table and 
the 10 or so people I was having dinner with were cracking up about that. But like, like I said, things are too serious. Yeah. Things are. Um, so the evolution of becoming a breeder when there's no information out there, you know, we're all lucky now there's a book we could read back then you guys wrote the book. And that's what I love about the old school guys. Um, like you said, you were incubating eggs in a cupboard above a oven because it was a good temperature. What was some big breakthroughs along the way that you felt that when you guys figured it out, like, you know, this is how we got to do it. We've been doing it wrong for years. Like, tell us about some of the obstacles you guys had along the way. Well, the obstacles were the eggs would always go bad. And, you know, they people would tell you to clean them off with this stuff. Well, my experience is when an egg goes bad, you're not going to save it. You, you need to work with good eggs. And <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't know about obstacles. It was just trial and error. You just kept doing the Well, OK, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> the Durango Mountain Kings. Now, I was one of the first ones to get those to breed on a regular basis. And... <clears throat> If somebody suggested I should write an article or a book or something about, you know, breeding the Durango Mountain Kings. And about the time I started thinking to do that, I thought, well, I mean, all of a sudden my breeding stopped. All of a sudden I was getting bad eggs or no eggs. I thought, well, crap, that, that shows the old adage, the minute you think you know something, they tell you you don't. And I just happened to be having a conversation with my sister who worked with a local power company. And we we're talking about our electric bill. And I said, well, you know, our bill doesn't really seem to be that bad recently. She said, well, no wonder. It's, it's the last two years have been the warmest winters we've had around here in about 20 years. The light came on. Aha. I wasn't getting the snakes cold enough, you know, for hibernation because where they live way up in the mountains, it gets cold. But they go under a rock and stay fairly consistent. And so if you've got them in a room that's warm in the day and cold at night and warm in the day and cold at night. That's not what's happening in nature. Basically they're cold, but they're consistently cold. And we started finding out that if you kept them chilled a little bit and kept them cool, they didn't wake up with mouth rot the next spring. But if you had them in a room that, you know, fluctuated radically, then they'd get mouth rot. <clears throat> and I'd actually have to give credit to some kids that were over in uh, Tucson at the time. They were, collecting gray bands over in Texas. And, and if, if you caught a fresh male or female and you put it in, they'd breed with the ones you had, but anything you've had for any length of time just sat there and didn't do anything. And so they decided, well, hell, we're gonna, and this was a very valuable collection back then. We're gonna just take them out and put them in this cool shed in the backyard and let them spend the winter there like they would in the wild. And all of a sudden they started breeding. <clears throat> Now, I found the same thing with California king snakes. Um, I would catch a California king and put it in with, you know, some of the ones I had. And if it was a male, it would breed the females, although we didn't get good eggs most of the time. But once we figured out this cooling them down in the winter, it um, just sort of opened up the doors for a lot of stuff. Hmm. That's always exciting. Now, now there's, <clears throat> there, there's different schools of thought, and you might – you might say there's four or five things that are important and three or four things that are influencing, but not that important. But if you get any two or three of the important ones and one or two of the not so important ones together, you'll have success because people will tell you, well, I didn't do that. And yet I hatched something. I remember of some friends in Oklahoma that um, had um, under and mill snakes breeding. And I said, well, do you cool them? Because, you know, you wouldn't think in Honduras you'd need to cool them. And down there they might, you know, go with the rain cycles or something. But no, we didn't cool them. We just kept them in the room at the, you know, the same temperature. Well, what room? Well, it's out in the garage. Well, was it heated? Well, no. Um, what's that white stuff under your yard in the winter? Snow. So they were hibernating them, but they didn't realize they were hibernating them. Or, you know... <clears throat> I call it hibernation. Um, <laughs> a lot of people seem to think that's the wrong term, but anyway. Yeah, people argue brumation is the wrong term, too. You can't please well, everybody. Brumation, brumation to me sounds like something with a cow eating out in the field and chewing it twice. I don't know why, but it just doesn't <laughs> sound like the right word for cooling an animal for a winter. <laughs> I'll take that. Um 
Well, you guys good? I'm. I don't want to take full control as always. You, go ahead, I buddy. Have, I have a uh, insight on a story that I want to hear about, but if you have yeah, go for it, buddy. Is the statute of limitations up on it? Oh. <laughs> um. So I know we're probably going to hop around kind of a lot, but I want to hear about your hunting of uh, anacondas. Well. <clears throat> Turned out I'm more of a desert person. Uh, the idea of being in a swamp full of bugs, well, when you're walking around at night in the Amazon with a flashlight looking for snakes, and it, you're, you're sweating, it's about 90 degrees, about 100% humidity. Uh, even when it's not raining, the stuff's dripping off the branches and everything. And so you're covered with bug spray, and you're wearing long sleeve shirts to keep the mosquitoes off. And I'm walking around, and all of a sudden, I noticed a black band on my wrist. And I'm thinking, I'm not wearing a black band. So I do this, and there's blood everywhere. My shirt slid back about half an inch, and the mosquitoes were solid along there. And <clears throat> so, I mean, I was I was convinced to go down there with Carl Switak and a few other guys. And, and um, I mean, we, we found quite a few snakes. But down there, the zoos <clears throat> are a little more open, shall we say, as far as you know, they're not going to be worried about getting sued or anything. And so Carl wanted to get a picture of this big anaconda that was in this wire cage that, you know, kind of a, not really a walk-in. You had to crawl through about a window screen size hole to get into it. And he convinced me that I should go in to grab this snake and pull it out of the water and bring it out so he could photograph it. <clears throat> well, no. I was on edge a little bit because the, the, this woman keeper, uh, my Spanish isn't real good, so we're having a little interpretation problem. But she first took us to the electric eels. And the electric eels were, if you can imagine a box made of pallets with plastic lining over it, filled with water, and there's these electric eels in there. And she was throwing things in there, and they were popping and snapping with their little electric stuff. And told me to, you know, be sure not touch the water when this is going on. So <clears throat> anyway, we got through that. And then she opened up this door and said, you know, be careful. There's a bigger one underwater that's really nasty. And so I'm slipping and sliding around on this slimy floor. Because it was basically a dirt floor with some logs in it and a tree branch. And I grabbed this one big anaconda by the head and started pulling it out of the water and it's starting to wrap around me. And I'm trying to get over the door to get out, but you got to kind of step up on a log and then step through. And the snake was probably about, I don't know, 12, 14 feet long. And by now it's wrapping around me and it's trying to bite and the mouth is open and you know it's slippery and kind of hard to hang on to. And about the time I'm, I'm saying, Carl, take the snake, I got to get out of here. He says, I've changed my mind. I don't want to take a picture of it anymore. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm thinking, well, shit, what do I do with this snake? <laughs> you know, how do I get it off and get away from it without getting bit? But managed to do it. But that was fun. But um, no, we, we got to ride around in the canoes and talk to the natives and do a little bit of trading for some trinkets and everything and found boa constrictors and uh, rainbow boas and uh, little tree tree vipers. Uh, um, I, I, you know, a few things. I mean, it's not nearly as snaky as you'd think. I mean, you go out into the deserts or some of the other places and you can find a lot more stuff than, than you can in the Amazon. It's, it's pretty well hidden there. But day and night, we were, you know, there's a group of us photographing all this stuff. And back when I, <clears throat> a lot of times I get invited to, you know, go to these different symposiums to give talks and I've got a you know a talk about Africa and a talk about South America and a talk about collecting in Texas and talk about collecting in the San Diego area and sometimes I throw a little bit of everything into it but I don't charge them for it. This is my my giving back, but I don't want to pay any money. So if somebody wants me, they fly me to wherever it is and I'm old school, so it's all 35 millimeter slides. I don't have all this fancy stuff that exists now. So they got to have a projector, but we just flash it up on the screen and tell stories and have a good time.
And then I just asked to stay a day or two in the area and have one of the members show me the local herpetological sites. And recently, I got to go to the Midwest Symposium and got to go to the Snake Road with a group of people and walked that and found a couple of water moccasins and box turtles and different frogs that I hadn't seen before. So it's just a way of getting around, getting to do things. Other than my <clears throat> quote unquote asthma from being a fireman for 30 years, um, I'm in pretty good shape. <clears throat> so we can still rent Bob whenever we want. Like if we sent you a plane ticket, you would just show up wherever we tell you to go? Pretty much, uh, depending on where you tell me to go and how okay. you say it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a very polite, convincing guy, great at sales. So it's going to sound great no matter what, I promise. <laughs> well, it sounds like it. Sound like with the way I get my vacations. <laughs> uh, so you've traveled to a lot of places and, you know, herbs in a lot of great countries. What's the yeah, one? Africa, Africa, you... Africa, South Africa. If you can get there, I'd recommend that. South just, Africa? Just, yeah, it's just about like San Diego County here. Um, I mean, we caught spitting cobras and 17-foot African rock python and um, puff adders and just all kinds of neat stuff stiletto snakes. I don't know. There, one of the guys made up a list and I think we had, I don't know, 80 or a hundred species of reptiles and amphibians between the whole trip. And half of them, I couldn't tell you what it was. <clears throat> Before we went, they got this book of, um, you know, the snakes of South Africa and basic, basically, <laughs> basically the first two thirds of the book are deadly animals. And, and over there, well, Okay, I'll give you an example now. They've got names for all these different cobras. And we found what should have been a DOR um, snake. And somebody said it was a blunt nose something or another, so I didn't think too much of it and threw it in a bag. <clears throat> it was dead, but we were going to pose it the next day, and I thought it was dead anyway. <clears throat> um, we were going to pose it the next day. And so <clears throat> I put it in the shower stall in the, in the room we had. And the next day I took it out in the yard and it still was completely limp. I should have been suspicious because it hadn't hardened up at this point, <clears throat> but I'm trying to pose it and it's flopping over because it's, it's limp. And so I'm tapping the face with my hand and trying to get it up. And all of a sudden it wakes up and hoods up and turns out that's the snake that killed Cleopatra. So, <clears throat> I mean, until they hood, they look like racers or very, very harmless things. And now the spitters, a lot of the guys had goggles. I found if you just wear your normal glasses, but you're looking straight at them, you get the stuff all over you, but it doesn't get into your eyes. So that was okay. But when you're chasing cobras, if you get them to stop and they hood, then they're easy to catch. It's chasing them. If you try to grab them with anything but a clamp stick, they get you. It's just, just like catching a racer that's deadly. But that was a lot of fun. <laughs> now in China, no, not China, in Japan, they we got taken out to some kind of a park or something. And they have something, I don't know, it's called a Michibushi or something. It looks like a little water moxin, but it looks more like a water snake. Well, they thought I was crazy because I'm walking around in this six-inch deep water, and I step on one of these things on purpose. And then I'm feeling around for its head, and I come up with it with the fangs doing this shit. American crazy, American crazy. <laughs> but like I said, it's fun. But what was weird is the most prominent amphibian over there were American bullfrogs and second, the uh, red slide, I mean, the slider turtles. So yeah, they're all yeah, over. I think, I think red eared sliders are, them, I, hear yeah. they're in, I hear they're everywhere, but I know they're the most invasive worldwide species. Um, you could find red eared sliders anywhere I've heard. Pretty much. <clears throat> so have you ever been bit by something that matters? Mm, well, I get, I got bit by a rattlesnake once and it died of alcohol poisoning. Um, <laughs> no, the, the only rattlesnake I was ever bitten by was a, a venomoid. And I used to, well, we used to have the MCRD nights at my house. I was mouse rat, and chi mouse, rat, chicken, drunk night. And oh. once in a while, I'd take bets whether I could pick this snake up without getting bit, knowing that it was devenomized. And uh, every once in a while, it would bite me. 
<clears throat> but I got bit by a heel monster once. And this is back in the days when you could buy them or maybe just after the days you can buy them. And a guy brought one over and <clears throat> I'm talking on the phone and holding it. And I must have loosened my grip because it did one of these things and suddenly was on my finger. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so basically I lowered my hand because it hurt and was grabbing a knife on the wall. And my friend was, well, buy it from me first before you cut its head off. I said, I'm not going to cut its head off. I'm going to use the knife to get in there and you know, open the jaw so I can get my finger out. So did that. And this, this guy was over here to sell me the snake, I mean the lizard, but I was supposed to give a lecture to a, a group of school kids, um, grade school, you know, kindergarten through sixth grade. And so I went ahead and wrapped my finger and was waiting for symptoms and it throbbed a little bit, but it turns out the, the lower teeth were across my fingernail and one of them went in, but I had never been bitten by a Gila monster before, so I wasn't sure what to expect. So I asked him to um, come with me to help. Well, I had about a 10-foot boa that I basically feed by tapping him on the, the nose with a rat. The guy had snakes, too. He introduces himself to his snakes by tapping on the head. Well, all of a sudden, the 10-foot boa has got him. And so now we, we show up in front of this class and I've got my finger wrapped up and I call my daughter up and I said, you know, can you, can you go to the nurse's office and get me some ice? Cause it was starting to throb. Well, she went over and told the nurse that I had been bitten by a heel monster and, you know, didn't bring the ice back. We brought the nurse back and she was kind of a cute thing, but I think she thought I was crazy. So she calls me over. So I tell my friend who's a big guy with a bloody, piece of towel wrapped around his hand. I said, just show slides and say whatever you want with whatever comes up. I'll be right back. <laughs> so I go over to talk to this nurse and she says, well, I understand you've been bitten by a Gila monster. I said, well, yeah, but I just need some ice because I started. Well, I call poison control. Oh God, here we're going to have some, we're going to have some problems because I'm not supposed to have venomous snakes or lizards where I am. Oh, well, that's another story. Remind me about animal control. <clears throat> but <clears throat> but um, anyway, I put my arm around her and I said, see that big guy over there? Um, I brought him because in case I pass out, because there's no antivenom for these things. So if I pass out on the stage, he's supposed to pick me up and take me to the hospital. But there's no point in staying home, so I might as well go ahead and give this lecture while I'm here. And she walked away shaking her head. I never did get my ice. But, <laughs> <clears throat> but um, like I said, it was fun. Now I used to used to go to Texas and Arizona and, and bring back rattlesnakes and then take them up to Western Zoological and sell them. Well, local animal control, <clears throat> I had friends there that when they got a rattlesnake call, they'd call me because they didn't want to crawl under a house or anything to get it, and I'd help them out. <clears throat> and so this is just the prelude to what I'm about to tell you. So. I came back from one of, and a lot of the kids in the neighborhood would hang out at my house because they found it very interesting. And so I had this uh, <clears throat> group of rattlesnakes, probably 20 or 30 of them. And apparently one of the kids told the parents, hey, he's got a whole bunch of rattlesnakes. So they called the police department rather than animal control. So <clears throat> they sent a cop with the animal control guy to come over and basically bust me. And the, the guy was, I'm sorry, Bob, I'm sorry, Bob, you know, because I knew him, but but he didn't get a chance to warn me or anything. And so the guy walks into my back room, which you go through the garage past all those snake cages and then through a screen door. And then there's a, a glassed in patio, a big fireplace, big room where I had all the baby snakes in walls and the wall. <clears throat> anyway, he walks in and says, I understand you have some rattlesnakes. Well, I couldn't deny it. There's 10 gallon aquariums and they're rattling at him. And, you know, it's, yeah, okay, I've got some. He said, well, I'm going to have to cite you and confiscate the snakes. And he had a five gallon bucket with him. Well, I looked at him. I said, well, what kind of roses do you like? What kind of flowers do you like? He looked at me kind of funny. I said, well, if you try to get 30 or 40 of these rattlesnakes into that five gallon bucket, you're going to get bit. You're going to die. I'm just not sure what kind of flowers you'd like at your funeral. 
And by the way, when you when we go to trial, and you, you I'm asked, uh, do you have rattlesnakes or did you have rattlesnakes? I says, yeah. Um, I respond with animal control all the time, and and you know a lot of times I'll draw them off at the house so I can take them out and release them. That's not going to look too good for you. And then my friend says, I've got an idea, Bob. Let me use your phone. <clears throat> so he called apparently the the cop or the mayor or somebody, which the mayor, by the way, had my same name. And that was sort of weird. That's another story. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so the my animal control friend calls the cop over and he says, it's for you. And apparently it had gotten as high as the mayor and then back down to the police chief. And the guy was ordered to leave. And he says, well, you've got a week to get rid of him. I said, or what? You're not coming back. God damn it, I know, you know, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, it's, you know, you can't take it too seriously. You just do what you do and, and hopefully you get away with it sometimes. But I, ideally, <laughs> well, I had a, I mean, California is a, a bad place for reptiles. I ended up finally buckling under pressure and getting rid of my helis. But I remember once Elko and Animal Control had a call where a guy had some exotic snakes. Now, this animal control guy is the same guy that was coming to the house once in a while trying to bust me. But he was very impressed with the way I kept things and everything. And we weren't really friends, but I think he just acknowledged, hey, I'm a good asset. So they couldn't get a hold of the zoo. So he called me and he's, you know, I'm, I'm out here in Campo, which is 45 miles away from where he was. But can you meet me at so-and-so's place? Uh, they, they've got exotic snakes and some of them have horns. Well, I'm figuring sidewinders or something. So I get down there and the guy's got gaboon vipers and Russell's vipers and cross of this and that and the other thing. Now, fish and game would not give me a permit to relocate snakes. I mean, I, you know, I basically do it anyway, but they wouldn't give me a permit. And yet, here's elk on animal control wanting me to take, I don't know, 20 or so of the world's most dangerous snakes home and keep them until trial. And then probably I'd end up owning them. I was already figuring out who I was going to sell them to. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's ironic the way things work. But it turned out they finally got a hold of the zoo. And so now I got to get on the phone and tell the zoo guy exactly which species there are. Because for them to come out, they had to bring the anavanine with them in case they got bit. So that was a far. But what made the papers? He had an alligator in the living room. Well, that's <laughs> alligator in a 100-gallon tank. And that's what made the news, not all these dangerous venomous snakes in the garage. But That's funny. Then, all right, well, now that people know what a gaboon was, I'm sure. So you got to go with what people know. Yeah, well. He had a really cute girlfriend that really took the wind out of my sails because, I mean, she's wearing a halter top, no bra, shorts, and gorgeous. And she looks at me and says, oh, you talked at my class when I was in the third grade. And I, Psh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> but, uh, old but rememberable, buddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. So what's next? Oh, with you, it's anything, man. We can go in any direction you want. Um, well, hey, it's your show. Yeah, kind of. It's, it's more It's more Ben's show. I just show up every once in a while. <laughs> so I know you, you told me on the phone once that you did a symposium. I think it was in England or somewhere. That, and you said you walked in and you realized you're in like a, like a big a, – like a – a stadium almost like it was yeah that was, that was that uh, all royal thing oh that was the royal thing i had already given some smaller talks uh, or shorter smaller groups in some of the local herb societies they they've got some kind of a fancy museum over there that's in an old castle and i mean some of those things you just wonder how in those days they managed to cut rocks and pile them up like that i mean some of those castles are amazing yeah but but at the london zoo that's where the all Royal something annual conference. I, I forget the fancy title, but, but it, you know, they walked me into this room and I'm on stage with, I mean, there's probably 500 people in there, but it's no big deal. I mean, you just, 
you know, I'm getting over my shyness pretty well. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> yeah. um, I've never been so, shy. No, neither. Um, so modern day compared to the past, um, like, you know, you're not on social media, which is fine. Um, what do you mean? Isn't this social media? Are we being social? This is extremely, so this is a big step in life right here, buddy. This is social media on the max. Um, there you go. You should have so, seen what we went through with Ben to try to figure out how to work this camera. <laughs> we talked about one of us flying out there to sit down with you with the interview. That's how bad we wanted to get you on here. Like, we went through every option. I had an extra cell phone I was going to send you. Well, I, my wife's got a cell phone. But uh, the only uh, time I – see, I, I, when I'm driving, I don't really want to have people call me and talk to people on the phone because in, in the old days, the phones were hooked to the wall. And I've always been very busy. And anytime anybody called me, I couldn't get further than the wall, you know, or wherever the phone was. And I always felt it was keeping me from doing something I should be doing. And even though we now have portable phones, I still feel the same way. I don't like to be on the phone talking to people. If, if I were in person, we can talk forever and I can still take care of the animals or, you know, do whatever I want to do with you. But the phone imprisoned you. But when I went to Japan, um, there's a time difference. And when I came home, I actually got home three, or I home, the local airport. I got home three hours before I left. And my wife was expecting me the next day. And I was expecting me the next day as far as international travel went. So now I'm at the airport trying to figure out a way to get 60 miles to home. So I talked to a young lady that had one of those cell phones we're referring to and called home and there was no answer. I think, hmm, wife's gone. Doesn't think I'm coming home till tomorrow. Suspicious because my first wife disappeared when I was on the fire department for 24 hours. And <clears throat> I came home and was walking up to the house and, Guy in the car gets out and says, are you Bob Applegate? I, yeah. Hands me papers, and I'm starting to read all that legal shit about so-and-so versus the state of California thing. And I opened the door and closed it behind me, and it echoed. And I looked up. No furniture. Chandelier on the ceiling is gone. Uh, I mean, you know, so <clears throat> immediately I had a flashback about, hmm, am I going to come home to an empty house? Well, that'd be okay, but let's figure out how to get home to this house. <laughs> so I ended up getting a hold of somebody who gave me a ride out there, and then I had to break into my own house, and then I started calling all of her friends to try to figure out where she is, and I called her daughter up in Oregon who starts calling around with, my mother's missing, and so that <laughs> uh, led, to, <laughs> led to another little scenario, but <clears throat> eventually, turns out she was sewing with a group, you know, she does a lot of quilting. And she didn't think I was coming home till the next day. So she was off doing her sewing thing. So all's good that ends well. But for a while there, it was. But then I thought it'd be nice to have a cell phone. But <laughs> again, I got home. <laughs> yeah, you made it. Yeah. Uh, well, cell phones are overrated, honestly. I think like a lot of us, we talk about deleting a lot of stuff, our social media. But. I don't watch the news. So if it wasn't for social media, I wouldn't even know what was happening in the world. Like it's my source of fake news. No, <laughs> oh, that sounds it sounds like a politic a political statement. <laughs> it might have, but we talked about that. We're not going political yet. That's 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 <laughs> third hour stuff. That's the diehards who make it to the end might hear a political talk. <laughs> Maybe. Nah. How in the world would you even go about running a business in this day and age without social media? Like, it's impossible. Well, I do have a website, although <laughs> I think it's still up because I, I basically have been snakeless for about three years now or animalless. And, uh, uh oh, oh, yeah. damn. Look <laughs> at that. Yeah, it's still ben, up. Yeah, <clears throat> Ben's good. <laughs> but um, anyway, well, you guys are good. How'd you do that? <laughs> What that? Did you make that? Were you on AOL when you made that page? Like, what's going on here? That's Hell, a throwback. Wow. There's my Oregon farm girl. <laughs> but 
Anyway, we uh, <laughs> we basically uh, had a friend that's into the whatever you call this social media stuff, and so he helped me set up a website and maintain it. I just send him a price list and uh, send him pictures every once in a while, and then every year we do a what we'd call a, a greeting card update because. I, I don't know. I personally don't really believe in these greeting cards where you get something happy birthday and it's a printed message or Merry Christmas or whatever. So, I mean, if you want to talk to me, write me a letter or call me on the phone or, you know, make it personal, but, but a commercially printed thing does nothing. So I always started out with, this is my annual Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Birthday, Happy anything else because you're not getting a damn card from me. Uh, and then go from there. <clears throat> I like it. Can we talk about can we talk about this one picture I just found? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not me. What do you want to talk about? That's not you? No, it looks like it might be Ernie Wagner and uh, um, <laughs> Don Hamper. Okay, That's there's there. a lot of pictures on uh, on Google here, you know. But no, but that was Don Hamper and I think Ernie Wagner in that picture was a whatever it was. Yeah, that one. Oh, I guess I can't point at it, but <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, Ben. You can edit that part out. <laughs> I still, still think it's a funny picture. <laughs> yeah, some of those were at my house, but that one wasn't. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about milk snakes. Because milk okay. snakes were a big part of what you did for years. Um, what made you want – I know you said you wanted to work with stuff you can cool down so you can have a little free time in your life, which, you know, I'm all about that. Um, let's talk about just, you know, the building of a milk snake collection back in the day. You know, some of the stuff you wild caught, some of the mutations that you either found or people brought to your attention. Like, yeah, I mostly, hear the mostly the latter. Mostly, um, I mean, the, the likelihood of you going out and finding an albino something. In fact, I've hatched thousands of snakes and have never hatched an albino that I didn't expect to be there from the bloodlines. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the likelihood of finding something um, rare is very slim. But <clears throat> I just um, got into the, you know, milk snake, king snake group because they're relatively small. They make good pets. They're easy to take care of. Uh, you don't have to be feeding rabbits. I mean, when I had the big pythons and, you know, you'd feed a couple 10 pound Flemish giant rabbits to this snake and it dumped, you'd need a snow shovel to get the chunk out. I mean, it just, I'd come home from being a fireman gone for 24 hours and open the door. And I mean, it had to go through the patio and in the sliding door and then through the house, I'd open the door. And, yep. The Python took a dump. I mean, you just, <laughs> you just knew, <clears throat> but these smaller things were much more convenient. And like I said, after a while it started being work. And I mean, when you're, you know, got a couple hundred snakes and you're raising the rodents to feed them and just, was much more convenient to stick with the smaller colubrids. Now I did have, you know, some of the gopher snakes at the time and <clears throat> tried indigos once, but they are the most God awful messy snakes I've ever dealt with. I mean, I swear it, it would back up to the most remote corner of the cage and then just like a grease gun with dead fish squirt up on the side of the wall. And you spent, you, you could have 20 cages and you spend more time cleaning the indigo snake than the other 19 altogether. Sounds right. Just, it was just convenient, and they were extremely attractive, and they were never the glamour issue. I mean, you know, you had the rise and fall of the little dwarf monitors and the rise and fall of this bow and that bow. And, I mean, the the, the colubrids, you know, the milk snake, king snake group was never super exciting, but it was always constantly in demand. You could always sell them. <clears throat> and so it just seemed like a convenient place to land. I agree with that. Um, so it, what were you selling them for, like price-wise? What were the prices that you were – so you were getting them, you know, like in the 70s, uh, maybe even earlier. I didn't, I didn't really start breeding the milk snakes that early, I don't think. No, because that, that was – you know, it was almost the 80s, I think, before we started seriously breeding them. But 
<clears throat> I mean, they were not that much higher than they are now. I mean, my first Pueblin, I think I paid two hundred fifty dollars for, and now you wholesale them out at twenty five to thirty bucks. But, but um, you know, some of the others. I mean, the the wild cod zanata. Um, originally, when I had them on my list, they were twenty twenty five dollars each, and when I started breeding them, I mean, fishing game. <laughs> Fish and Game told me if, if I can breed some that I can tell between, you know, between the wild ones and the domestic ones, we'll let you sell them. So I bred three generations and trying to, you know, get some that had stripes on them to where you could, you know, a lot of broken bands. And they said, well, we're still not going to let you sell them. Um, you know, you got until January 1st to get rid of them or we'll arrest you. And so that's. Like I said, California can be a pain in the ass. Now they were, they were nice enough to give me time to get rid of the Gila monsters, and so I ended up selling them to uh, China. I think, um, I think they went through Hong Kong or something. But um, <clears throat> this Chinese guy came down, and I don't know if you've ever had thirty-eight thousand dollars given to you in twenties, but there was one mountain of money, <laughs> and they were all in brown bags, seven or eight hundred dollars per bag. And I never did quite get the under, you know, the explanation of why they were <laughs> in those increments and, and like that. But but they spent. So, but I didn't, I, I wouldn't sell the big beaded lizard to him. I, I sold all the other beaded lizards and all the Gila monsters to him. But Fernando, my big guy, he was the world record size. Um, he was something like 42 inches at the time I had him. And, Chad Brown has him now. Um, as far as I know, he's still doing well. And he he was brought in at Western Zoological in 1968 as a young adult. So it's definitely a world record for longevity as well as size. I remember the guy that wrote one of the Gila Monster and Beaded Lizard books, um, guy over in Arizona. He called me and you know asked me how big you know the biggest lizard I'd ever had was at the time it was 38 inches. So he put, you know, the record length 38 inches, but that's when Fernando was 38 inches. He kept growing. So I don't know how big he is now, but, but uh, he's definitely world, world length. Pretty amazing. Huh? Go ahead guys. I'm just enjoying listening to the stories, man. Like, <laughs> all right. Well, that's that's kind of what's fun. You know, we go to these symposiums and, Sure, you got a formal presentation or something, but you know, sitting around in the lounge having beer and swapping stories—that's that's what's fun. That's that's what makes it worthwhile to me. Do you still frequent any of the shows in California? Like, what is it? Well, they haven't the had any because show? of this COVID thing for about a year. But uh, the, the um, which one is this? Yeah, this, this is the Super Show. Rami, you know, does the Super Show here on the West Coast. And let's get physical. Which one is that? Yeah, I don't know that show. <laughs> that show is that. Show. <laughs> that has a good yeah. show at his house every night, you know. <laughs> then they have a nice one over. They have a nice one over uh, Arizona, um, at uh, in Mesa, and um, of course, you know the big show, um, Wayne Hill down there in Florida, and and uh, um, Bob and Sherry Ashley do the their shows in California and Texas and Chicago and um, IR, you know, NARBC. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's, you know, they're, they're fun to go to, but, but um, you know, it's, it's more fun in the lounge in the evening, sharing stories and drinking with them. Yeah. The camaraderie taken off the table this past year with COVID has been kind of excruciating. I, all yeah, my definitely. friends are reptile people. I don't get to travel anymore. I'm practically friendless. <laughs> Is that why you're in a car? Well, that's, um, <laughs> well, it's kind of why I'm in a car. No, we're, I live out in the middle of nowhere. I got to drive to the gas station and do these podcasts. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So make it work. Well, I'm, <clears throat> my first stop sign when I leave my driveway is eight and a half miles away. And the next one's 40 something. So I can identify with you. It's nice, isn't it? I prefer it, it this way. I do too. Um, Got a little well, little mountain shack here, about five thousand square feet, and 
indoor bar an indoor jacuzzi an outdoor pool with a water slide and can shoot guns out the back window and nobody complains so what more can you want right yeah we America. get away with a little bit out here ourselves you, um, you should have flown out you should have flown out and done the interview you'd love uh, it you know what there's always a part two maybe i'll fly <laughs> out for part two i just it's got to be a time we all should herping. like i need the full experience yeah, yeah. It's gonna it's gonna be a party at Bob's house, man. We're all gonna go. Yeah, well, you know we I'm used not... to we used to have parties during the shows out here, but sometimes people didn't make it back because um, <laughs> it's you know forty five to sixty miles from where the shows are, and they get a little carried away, and I find them passed out in the driveway or whatever. One guy tried to drive out the gate and missed it and ended up against a tree, and um, so we kind of stopped doing that. <laughs> Well, that's sad. If you want to bring that tradition back, I feel like I can hang. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at one at one time we had over twenty people sleeping in the house in various places, and unfortunately, one of them was sleeping under the table in the formal dining room. And apparently, the girl got sick and threw up and didn't bother saying anything. So, when we mm. got home from the show that evening, uh, it wasn't python shit we were smelling; it was vomit. So my <laughs> wife just kind of kind of put the kibosh on having people stack like cordwood around the different rooms. That well, is a party foul. Yeah. Ugh. I've never thrown up while drinking. We will not have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can come over and hang out and, you know, go stay somewhere else or, uh, it's only hey, when Dave hey. gets into ayahuasca. That's when he throws up. He's good to go on every other party drug. Just about every other one. <laughs> what was the one? <laughs> ayahuasca? Yeah. Yeah. What's you spent some time in the Amazon. You telling me you didn't get down? What's up? Uh, ba basically, when I'm on, because you know, even when we're going out here to the desert, a lot of people will say, "Well, let's get a six pack and go out hunting." I said, "No, let's go hunting or get a twelve pack and stay here, but we're not <laughs> going to be drinking and driving around the desert looking for snakes." <laughs> it's probably Something a good rule. Should be mixed. <laughs> well, most of the places where we go, you're in and out of the park and. And sometimes you got to dodge the various law enforcement agents if you're actually collecting or they know me well enough. Well, they used to. I haven't done this for years, but I think I was some kind of a feather in their cap if they could give me a ticket or something. So they, they would hunt for Sneaky Snake back when I had my van, especially. I don't know how they knew it was me. I had a four foot snake with glowing eyes on each side. And then in the back, there was an arrow pointing to the left that said ladies leg inspection ahead. So it was very inconspicuous. <laughs> Plus the aircraft oh, landing yeah. in the front didn't help. <laughs> okay, Bob. So just so you know, we give one compliment a show. And I'm going to throw mine out there. Uh oh, You truly sound like you live life to the fullest, buddy. I, I try. I'm a little envious of your life. It sounds like you had a, it's a good run. You're killing it. Well, since this COVID thing, I haven't been able to play, but normally I play softball three days a week on senior teams. And, and I try to get my five to 10 miles of walking in a day and work out twice a week and, you know, for three, four hours and just try to stay in shape because I know my lungs are deteriorating because of all the fire department crap. And I'm trying to stay ahead of the deterioration because I know once I lose it, it's not coming back. <clears throat> well, keep doing what you're doing, buddy. No reason to change now. Ooh, it, huh? it makes me feel terrible about myself that you're healthier than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'll change that. No oh, reason you man. can't change That's it. that. I'm setting an alarm for 6 a.m. tomorrow. We're getting it in. <laughs> yeah. You know what's going to happen? You're not going to wake up tomorrow, and you're going to scrap the whole idea. Yeah, like, yeah. It, <clears throat> I mean, you got to go sometime. You might as well yeah. go on your terms. Yeah, I agree. Listen, we'll just, I'll drink enough tonight to forget about it tomorrow. It's okay. <laughs> Are you drinking on the Buffalo theory of drinking? Absolutely. Uh, Do you yeah. know that theory? Nope, but I'm in. Whatever you say, <laughs> brother. Let's go. <laughs> Everybody knows that a herd of buffalo is only as fast as the slowest buffalo. Otherwise, they string out and they're no longer a herd. But things that eat buffalo hang back and they jump on the slower, weaker ones and kill them but that actually improves the buffalo herd. They become faster and stronger. 
Everybody knows that alcohol kills brain cells, but they only kill the slower, weaker brain cells, thereby improving the efficiency yes. of the brain. Science. If you don't believe it, ask anybody that's had a few drinks. They always feel smarter. That is science. <laughs> I am in 100. <laughs> yeah, see, it's a great theory, but the problem is with Ryan, he's the fastest buffalo on the show when he does drinking. So it's almost, it's the fuel for Ryan. Well, you got to also realize that alcohol is a preservative, so it'll make you last longer. There you go. There you go. This guy, me and him, yeah. we're, we're hanging out. That's all I'm well, saying. We got, you know, there's, there's certain gems of wisdom you pick up in 75 years that maybe you got your young kids haven't learned yet. Please be my mentor. <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're doing it wrong, Bob. I and mean, that's the truth, which is I but thought I was going hard. The fact, I thought you're, I was doing, the fact right, you're but... doing it is what's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um. Well, hell, um, let's talk about another country. Do you say you've been to Australia yet? Has that been on I your list? I haven't been there yet. That's, that's on my bucket list. Oh. You better get on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> actually, actually, about a couple of years ago, I got rid of all the snakes and cages and everything, and I thought I'd start traveling and then this COVID thing came up, and so it kind of snafu'd that. Yeah, that happened to a lot of people. So the property that we bought out here in Missouri, sweet couple was living there. They retired. Their plan was to sell the property and travel the world. They sold it to us. Six months later, COVID popped up, and they're stuck here now, living in a smaller <laughs> place. I, I almost feel bad. Um, I would have retired on this property if I was them. Well, that's kind of the way I feel about my 15 acres here is, you know, my next stop is either a grave or a rest home because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get rid of this place. I mean, it's a lot larger than two of us need, but, you know, I like space inside and out. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I never thought I needed space until I had it, and now I don't want to live without it. There's well, nothing better than outside, you know, we, we live at a roughly 3,000 feet, and, you know, we're in kind of a valley between the coast and the desert. If I go 60 miles to the west, I'm in the ocean. If I go 40 miles to the east, I'm in snake hunt and desert country. I go two miles to the south, I'm in Mexico, and there's no way I want to go there. Um, and then if I go north, I'm in, you know, 6,000-foot high mountains with a mountain king. So that's 15 miles from here. So I'm kind of in a good zone. That's a sweet spot for sure. And then we have probably 15 different species of snakes on the property and about 10 different species of lizards. And a couple of them, you know, the Cope's leopard lizard and the Baja racer is, you know, only found in the United States in this little area. They're actually a Mexican species that's come across the border. And um, so it's, it's, you know, I, I've got a, a road going around the perimeter and, we walk in on a regular basis and see all sorts of different life. Now that my wife is raising chickens, we've had to thin out the predators a little bit. So we shot a few coyotes and a bobcat and a few other odds and ends. But but um, normally I would consider my place a wildlife refuge. But but when they start eating the chickens, uh, my wife gets insistent that they go. Well, you know what you got to do? You got to add an emu to the colony. The huh. chickens will love it. It'll take care of all your coyotes, your bobcats, and your raccoons. Well, we let the chickens run loose on the property during the day, and then they go in at night. So, so uh, you know, they spread out quite a bit. So I don't know about the emu and how we'd handle it. <laughs> okay. If it's, anything, if, it's, if it's anything like the insurance commercial, I don't think I'd want it around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you guys get along just fine, honestly. Um, get five of them. Cover the whole property. Seriously, 10, 20 surveillance emus w roaming around? Yeah. 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 You'd be able to set. You'd be scaring the, the, the coyotes and the coyotes that are smuggling the Mexicans at the same time. You'd be on point. <laughs> yeah, right? well, believe it or not, since the wall, the Mexican problem has <laughs> slowed down considerably. We've got a pretty solid chunk of wall south of us. But from, from my backyard, you can actually see the wall. Wow. Pretty crazy. Um, so all right, let's talk about the wall. Okay. <laughs> so with species now that have been able to go back and forth, 
does that bum you out? Like, that's probably one of the negatives that I've heard about this whole thing. You know, just uh, the, the wall. The wall is the wall has got about six inch gaps, or their beams, and there's about six inch gaps in between them, and anything you care about can go right through the holes. Okay. Well, that's confident anything. I, I think even that. a coyote could go through it. I'm sure about a coyote. Um. Uh, so okay. So usually we get a little more off topic like this later on. I think people want to hear more animal stuff. Okay. Let's. What? You know what? I've just been told you're a talker. Just, just talk to us. Just, just take us whatever direction you want to go right now. Don't, well, you gotta, don't let us lead the way, man. You know what you, you got to give me. Right you got to give me a starting point. It's it's 1965. <laughs> you know you're you're feeling loose. What's going on? What's happening? 1965. Now, <clears throat> I, I have a limited memory capacity <laughs> intentionally because I can't testify against anybody that might have done anything in the past. I have learned to forget names and forget places because when you're on trial for various things, that comes in very handy. You don't try to make something up because somebody's going to come up with, you know, hey, I can show this isn't right because you said this some other time. But if you just say, I don't know, or I don't remember, nobody can pin you down. Take that to the bank. <laughs> Words to live by. I can, I can give you a direction a little bit if we're going animal wise. What is the top five species you've worked with and why? Well, that would be very tough because I could – Basically, I feel I could have anything that's in this world, you know, reptile-wise, I could get if I wanted it. And really, I got, you know, I've been working recently with about 20 different species because I cut way back. I We used to do a couple thousand babies a year, and that got to be work. And so we got rid of a whole lot of the stuff, um, you know, back in the – corn snakes and the albino prairie kings and the albino speckled kings and the albino black rat snakes and the Texas rat snakes. And you know, got rid of all of those just because they were so prolific and just too many. Something had to go. Gopher snakes, got rid of them. Um, but the group of milk snakes, just, I don't know, I just, you, you don't want just a couple of them because you want to, you know, we, we try to breed out and, you know, have unrelated. So we might have a colony of three, you know, one male and three or four females, and then another colony of male and three or four females. And, and when we pick out future breeders, most, most of the milk snakes have what I call a useful life of about 10 years, at least the breeder females. And so when they get to about seven years, um, you know, a lot of times you can grow them up faster, but just on the safe side, when the animals got to be about seven years old and I wanted to continue those lines, I would pick out at least one to replace it and start growing it up. Sometimes I'd pick two, but I would try to, you know, maybe take male number 100 and female number 140 and take a, a baby from that one, but then take another baby from this one over here in the other cage that is completely unrelated or as unrelated as I could get to keep the genetic diversity going. I didn't want to breed brother and sister, which if I had, I would have been the one that started the albino Nelson's milk snakes because originally uh, one guy caught three wild females, uh, excuse me, a, a male and two wild females of what at the time was Nelson. I, and he brought them up and produced some babies. And I ended up with the, the adults, but I would always, one of, one of those females must have been a pet for albino. And I ended up with the trio <clears throat> before they really got going. And when I was raising up animals to breed, I would take babies from the one female and breed them to the other female babies. And had I bred brother and sister, I probably would have started producing the albinos because hmm. that one female, I think, was the head that started everything. But anyway, just, I mean, genetic diversity could be good, but maybe not. I mean, if you, if you look at that mountain across the street, 
the snakes have probably been there for a thousand years. They've got to be interrelated. But yeah. if there was anything that was, you know, a death gene, if you want to call it that, they probably would have died out. So probably there's no no bad genes in there or the snakes wouldn't be there. But on the other hand, if you get an albino or some kind of a weird pattern morph or something, obviously something genetically screwed up. And there's a much more likelihood that there's other screw ups that maybe not be obvious on the surface. I mean, back when uh, Ernie Wagner and um, Glenn Slimmer were breeding corn snakes, and they're breeding them. Uh, they interbred several different generations. And they were kind of proud of it, mostly Glenn Slimmer. But he ended up with corn snakes that would have, they'd breed, they'd lay eggs, they'd hatch, they'd eat once, and they'd roll over dead. Hmm. And nobody really figured out why. I, to this day, I don't know why. But he was bragging that he had seven generations of brother, sister, brother, sister. So I'm a little suspicious that, you know, there was something in there that uh, was very negative. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've but always I, heard... I, I, I couldn't name my top five. No, you're fine. And I imagine over the years, you probably kept over 200 species, probably more than that with everything you've dealt with. Probably. Yeah. Well, especially, especially when I was commercially importing. I mean, um, you know, I was importing from India, Madras, India, um, Ceylon, um, different places in Africa. Um, actually, I never imported from South America because you could buy them in U uh, Miami cheaper than you could bring them directly in because everybody had family members that, you know, my brother's over here in Miami and my uncle is the one that sends them up and you try to deal with the uncle. No way. You got to deal with. But back then, boa constrictors were $4.50 each if you bought 100 of them. Which is crazy. Um, Can I just ask real quick, like, if we, took a, if we took a snapshot of, like, what the peak of Bob Applegate reptiles was, like, like when was that? What was going on? Like, how, how many species were you working with? How many animals you're producing like what did that look like that was a mess <laughs> it was it was just way too much work um i mean essentially well <clears throat> i mean I, I built a shoebox rack that had originally i think 36 shoe boxes then i built another one because we were expanding a little bit for 160 and of course you'd go to the, the local drugstore to buy these shoe boxes. So then I built another rack with 160, but every time I built a new rack, I couldn't find the same shoe boxes. And so basically you had a certain group you had to wash and change in this cage and a certain group in that cage. Well, when I moved up here to Campo, I had a, I don't know, a thousand four hundred shoe boxes and I bought all the same ones the sterilite, not the sterilite, but the clear ones. And so they're all the same and they're all the same uh, mold because even, even when you're buying the same ones, you get a couple of years apart. Sometimes they change the mold just slightly or something. And so when you're stacking them, they stick and then the bottom ones crack on you. So you end up losing them. And so we had, I don't know, I think we had 1400, 1450 shoe boxes filled plus we would stack cages or shoe boxes on the you know in the room when it was warm during the summer with all the hatching because all, all of these shoe boxes had heat tape under them and it was on thermostats and um, dimmers so that you could you know not let it get too hot because just the thermostat is on off and you know that's not good because suddenly it gets really hot and then it gets cold and really gets hot so you want to be able to moderate it where it's the same temperature but, and then you have to have individual rows heated because of course heat goes up and what's good for the bottom ones wouldn't be so good for the top ones or vice versa. But uh, then we would have these shoe boxes stacked on top of the shelves with two by fours holding them down during the time when the, you know, the mass hatchings, if you want to call it that, until we got down to the point where they would all fit in the shoe boxes that went on the racks. So it just, it was just way too much work. 
See, I had to give up working to take care of the snakes. And then I gave up the snakes to basically go out and have a good time and enjoy life. And then COVID come along and I'm still enjoying life, but I'm kind of sheltered in my little 15 acre prison. Sounds like a really nice prison though. <laughs> oh, it is. People come here for vacation. They, oh, I'm they, sure. A lot, a lot of our family and friends say we're, we're going to stay at the snake ranch. And they come down and <laughs> stay here and use it as a base of operation to see San Diego and drive out of the mess and come up here in the quiet country. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I want to hear more about the back in the day stuff. Because, again, you know, I love I love hearing about the hobby before it was even the hobby. Like, I like hearing about the traveling. I like hearing about every aspect of it, the stories, the things well, that went uh, wrong. Like. Snake, snake hunting in Texas. I used, I've made 12 trips there. And the, the best part of the trip, well, there's two best parts. The best part, first, is the anticipation. You're getting ready to go. You're all excited. You know you're going to be out there in gray band country. And then the other best part is when you're home and you can tell the stories of all the miserable crap that happened between those two best parts. Because you're driving up and down the road, you practically got toothpicks holding your eyes open, you're ready to fall asleep, you're imagining seeing things, and um, then you do see something and it wiggles off the road before you can get stopped. And, um, or you come across, you know, you've gone for hours and then you come over a hill and there's a fresh dead one that the car that passed you about five minutes ago killed. Um, very frustrating. But, uh -huh. <laughs> but it's still, you know, you'd see the Transpagus rat snakes and the, the little hook nose snakes and little night snakes and and the, the lots of rattlesnakes. You'd see the westerns and the scoots and and uh, once in a while a blacktail, but usually you'd find them when you're field collecting. And the little rock rattlers, nor normally you'd field collect them. But um, I remember once I was walking along train tracks that went through a cutaway. And I was about in the middle and found this nice black tail coiled up inside of a thing. And then all of a sudden, a train's coming. And the thing is too steep to climb out. So I pressed myself against the wall. And I swear that train felt like it was going to suck me in. It was one of these hundred car things. And shit i just <laughs> it was a very uncomfortable feeling because the ground's rumbling and you think you're solid but it's you know with, within a foot or two of your back as it's going by and that wasn't a pleasant part of that trip <laughs> <clears throat> but after it went by i caught the rattlesnake yeah. so what's what's important copperheads you see the little copperheads down there too there's some really nice ones down there Oh, yeah. Well, I was just doing um just north of Dallas when I was down there for the Ellington show this past year. I went on a really nice little road cruising spot for copperheads. Um, it took a little while to get going, but once we started finding them, they were all some of the most impressive ones I've seen. Um, we got some really great ones in Missouri. They got a really nice peachy kind of tone to them, which I really dig, but they don't all look like that. Well, the Transpegas copperheads are really sharp looking. They're really nice and crisp and clean. Um, I had kept a few of them for a while, but... I, in, in the commercial part, you know, you have so many people coming through that you couldn't really keep anything that was illegal mm -hmm. um, for long. And then half, half the fun is showing people stuff. And so, I mean, if you've got something, you could have the rarest, whatever the heck it is. But if you couldn't show anybody and, you know, enjoy the adulation of, hey, wow, that's really neat. You know, what what point is it? What good is it? Mm -hmm. Agreed. So. Do you have any species that you've tried targeting over the years that you've not been successful with? Uh, not really, no. Got it dialed okay. in? Just figured it out? Well, I mean, some of, some of the animals were harder than others, but, but one of the reasons I settled with the milk snake, king snake things is they're pretty easy. <clears throat> I mean, once, once, once again, you figure out this, you know, five important, you know, which of the ones you need and, what works for you. Cause I mean, even, even some of the really good breeders, when they've moved to a completely different location, they've had to refigure everything because maybe the humidity is too high where you are or too low or, or who knows? I mean, you know, barometric pressure or, 
who knows? I mean, it's just hard to figure, but well, I'll give you an example of what's, what's really strange. Many, many years ago, a guy was willing to give me a ball python. He says, this thing won't eat. I just tried everything. I've tried gerbils. I've tried mice. I've tried baby rats. It won't eat. <clears throat> so I said, look, if, if I get it to eat, I'm going to sell it. So I'll give you five bucks for it. Gave him five bucks. I put it in one of the big cages on the floor in my snake room because it just happened to be empty. And I mean, it was so weak, it could barely crawl. I tapped it on the nose with a mouse and it opened its mouth and ate it. And so I fed it a couple of times, you know, slowly like feeding a starving man, you can't just plump them up. But, but a week or so later, I gave it two mice and got it in pretty good condition. And then I put it in a 10 gallon aquarium in the back because I needed the bigger cage for something else. Absolutely refused food, would not eat. I mean, the same room and everything, just different cage. Just on a whim, I took whatever was in that cage out, the big one, and put the snake back in. And within a day, it was feeding from my hand again. I mean, hmm. I've never been able to figure that out as to why. But there was just that particular snake or, or boas. Sometimes people will have boas and they can't get them to breed. And yet other, I, there was a pet shop near me that had them in the window display that were breeding and producing babies in the window. And yet a guy with a room that's thermostatically controlled and got a humidifier in it and doing all kinds of weird stuff, sometimes can't get them to breed. And it may be just as simple as that snake doesn't like this snake for whatever reason. Maybe they're from a different area and they have, you know, well, even the gray bands, certain ones seem to be more lizard eaters than some from other areas. And so, <clears throat> In fact, that's kind of an interesting story of where we started scenting the animals to get them to feed. Because when we bring back these gray bands, a lot of times the adults would not eat on mice. But if you sewed a lizard to the nose of a mouse, it would eat the lizard and swallow it. But you could go out field collecting and you turn over a board and there's young mice, you know, in a nest, grab them and throw them in. The snakes chase them around and are just voraciously hungry. And so then I, I'm thinking back to a Disneyland movie, or I think it was Disneyland, but one of these things where a baby deer doesn't have any sense. You know, it shows the mountain lion and the deer hiding and the mountain lion's walking by, but can't smell the deer because it doesn't have a scent. So I'm thinking maybe, maybe mice, wild mice have a different scent or no scent than domestic mice. And so what I did was I, it was a pure accident. I, I had one of these gray bands that I always offered a mouse to before I would feed it a lizard or, you know, lizard flavor the mouse. Well, the mouse fell in the water bowl and drowned and was floating around there for probably a half hour or so. Well, I didn't want to waste the mouse. So I laid it out on top of an abalone shell that I used for a hide and so they could rub on to shed. The snake crawled over and ate it. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm on to something now. So I started this scenting of, you know, just taking a non-perfume soap and washing the mice and washing the pinkies or whatever with, with pinkies. I would uh, cut a lizard's tail and put a little bit of blood on the nose of a washed pinky. And you could take some of these Zanata and Pyros and feed them by hand. Uh, just they loved it. It was just like eating a lizard because they take lizards from your hand. And you just accidentally stumble onto this stuff. And then I'm, I'm pretty well known in the business and always have been, I guess. I think there's an advantage to having a last name that's the top of the alphabet. So they're the first ones they see on any kind of a list. <clears throat> but people will come to me and they'll tell me these stories about things that worked for them or things that didn't work for them. And maybe 10 people will tell me different stories. And you can kind of put together what went well and what didn't go well. Another example of this accidentally discovering something is Terry Lilly used to import the Jackson's chameleons back in the day when, you know, they lived for a while and died. They, you couldn't keep them alive. And he was, he sold a Jackson's chameleon to this kid. And a couple of months later, um, he's working in the backyard and 
the kid and his mother come around the corner and he recognized them and thought, oh, crap, you know, they're going to want their money back or some kind of a complaint. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the Jackson's chameleon sitting on the kid's shoulder and it's glowing, radiant, healthy. And Terry, you know, he, he likes to pretend that he knows everything about everything. So he's cautiously saying, well, uh, what are you feeding them? Slugs and snails. Slugs and snails, a Jackson's chameleon. Yeah, they love them. You knew that, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, who's who's to guess that something that shoots his tongue out and grabs insects off of branches will bend over and crunch up a snail and eat it or eat a slug and thrive on it? And so we, we learned from that kid who accidentally tried something that hadn't been done because he didn't know that it wouldn't work, and it worked. And so you... Well, back when I was importing these candoyas, these Solomon Island boas, sometimes they'd have babies on the way over. And at one time, I had over 200 baby Solomon Island boas. And I was giving them away to people saying, this, this is a project for you. Find something besides mice that it'll eat. Because actually, we couldn't get most of them to even eat pinky mice. We had to use lizards. But just take these and go away. And offer them anything you can think of and report back to me if any of them, you know, find something they voraciously feed on. Well, none of them ever came back, but but that's the whole idea of, you know, experimenting. Don't don't have somebody tell you that isn't going to work until you've tried it, unless it hurts something. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the washing the pinkies thing was always like one of the most bizarre things to me when people would tell me about it. Uh, little Dawn dish soap, so and so forth. Now, was that something that you started and everything kind of went from it there? Probably, it probably evolved with other people at about the same time. But I didn't know anybody that did that when I did it. It's just like my drawer cages. Um, <clears throat> I give Ernie Wagner credit for them because he had a wooden box cage on top of a dresser drawer and he drilled a hole in it so the snake could go down into the drawer and i'm thinking i don't want a whole house full of drawers where i'm using the top so i just built cages with a sliding drawer underneath it but i got the the idea from ernie and seeing that um you know cage setup that he had because i thought it was a great idea and it turned out it was because when the snakes are hidden down there if there's only one, you can dangle a mouse in the hole and they're secure and, they'll, you know, they'll grab it. Or if you, when I got my, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, condominium cages built where they could go split level in six different drawers, I could keep a colony of one male and nine females in there. And I could lock them into individual compartments and feed them and, you know, make sure I recorded who ate what before, and maybe even keep them separate for a day. So there wouldn't be any food response, you know, one eating the other, and then let them back together. Um, that worked out really well. Hmm. And plus they got hmm. exercise because I don't know if you've seen them. They're, they're pictured on my site. But but the snake, <clears throat> there's, there's two glass. Well, just like these four windows we're looking at, there's two glass doors up here, two glass doors down here. But each of them had a drawer underneath, and the snake could go. Actually, it had... Here we go again. <laughs> there's there's three drawers. No, I don't think it's on the front page, but um, there's three drawers, or actually kitty litter boxes underneath the top two. So the snake can go into the drawer on the right. It can go into the drawer in the middle from one cage and go over under the partition and then come up and be in the other compartment and then go down into the third drawer. Or it can go through a hole in the back on either of the upper one and drop down into the lower last part and then go into three different boxes down there. So if I have one snake in this cage, it can actually go to six drawers and four different cages unless I put the PVC caps on it to block it out. And that gives them a little more exercise and lets them explore and, and you know, climbing and cruising around. Oh, it's got to be boring for a snake to sit over in the corner of a 10-gallon aquarium all of its life. No, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, no, I think that's a really unique cage idea. Honestly, you have me brainstorm while I'm listening to you talk about that. Um, 
That's actually, I really like that a lot. It worked very well. Um, let's see. I want to tell you out of steam here. We got other stuff. To oh, go to. well, you know what the problem is? I'm going to blame me a little bit today. I feel like I'm not really moving the conversation around like I normally would. I don't know why. Um, I'm really excited about this, but I'm just not bringing enough to the table for you. It's not well, true. Something. Me, I promise. Think of something. <laughs> well, I, I got some. Okay. Can, without incriminating. Uh huh. Can you tell us, and I don't know if it's been long enough, maybe it'll be fine. Can you tell us some of the interesting uh, importation stories you've had? Uh, well, hypo hypothetically. <laughs> you've heard um, of a guy who heard from a guy? Well, there was, a, there was a, a gentleman down in Colima that was known to sell Gila monsters. And he kept them in cattle troughs. And people were known to go down there and buy these animals for $25 each, 20 to 25. And he always had a bunch of them. But somehow, people always got arrested at the border. And somehow, he got his money back, or he got his animals back and could resell them. So at one, at one point, uh, this became known. <clears throat> and so one individual hypothetically went down and bought the lizards. And another hypothetical individual drove down in a different vehicle and met him in Tijuana and transferred the lizards, which were in gunny sacks, hypothetically, um, to his van and inconspicuously drove home while the other guy was strip searched and his car partially taken apart and didn't show up at the house for a couple hours, but was not any sort of a problem. <laughs> And then these animals were hypothetically divided up, but apparently the material on the gunny sacks had separated and there were several of them loose in this gentleman's van. <laughs> and we hypothetically caught them all, but one of the individuals happened to work on a military base as a fireman and was in a carpool and was driving back and forth for about two weeks Till he noticed a glob of shit on the carpet and <laughs> tore the van apart and found that he was transporting one of these Gila monsters back and forth to a Navy base for two weeks. <laughs> Hypothetically. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, I think it's um in the book Lizard King, they talk about the early days of smuggling and there'd be a box with four different levels and the bottom level will have the illegal stuff, and the next level above it will have like a bunch of tarantulas loose, and typically customs will well, just put the lid back on and pass it through. Um, even your comment you made before about hollowing out the top of the um, styrofoam box to put the um, geckos in, uh, mm -hmm. it's pretty clever. Um, well, tell me well, some no, more I mean, stuff. They, they were, well, oh, most, most, most of the stuff that was illegal that came in in those days was just labeled something else. I mean, it's the, the, the people looking at it didn't know what they were looking at. Well, it was just like when fish and game. Well, one time right after the Zanata were protected in California. Now, mind you, I've got all sorts of milk snakes, king snakes, and everything else. I happen to have one of the, or hypothetically, this person happened to have one of these Zanata past the time that was legal for him to have it. And the fish and game guy comes up and, Sure enough, it's plastered up right on the visible end of the shoe box. And he looks hmm. at it, it's just another one of them damn ring things, isn't it? I said, yep, it's another one of them damn ring things. If he had gotten a rise out of me, he would have, you know, probably arrested me. <laughs> well, it's back. I, I used to work on San Clemente Island. And there was wild goats out there that were dropped off during the, you know, Spanish colonies, things. They'd go by and eat them for meat. And I brought a a skull of home and put it in my snake pit. I had an outdoor snake pit at the time. <clears throat> and, um, and during one of the fishing game surprise investigations, uh, he spotted that and said, that's $500. I said, hell, I'll sell it to you for 100 He looks at me and said, no, big horn sheep, $500. I said, put the cuffs on. If you can't tell me the difference between a domestic goat and a big horn sheep, um, take me in. I'll have your job. Otherwise, get the F off my property. And I mean, back in those days, I 
didn't really work with them because I figured they were the enemy and I treated them as such. That was probably a mistake because later on when I started giving animal control uh, lessons and talks and everything else, I got a lot more. There's something about sugar does attract more than vinegar. So, mm -hmm. but I was kind of an impetuous, I don't know, I just, when you raise snakes, you're always thought it's kind of weird anyway. And so I was always kind of defensive, I guess I'd, I'd like to call it defensive, but sometimes I was pretty offensive. Yeah. I just wouldn't, wouldn't accept the way they were treating me and fought back. Yeah. I get that. And there's a lot of reptile guys that feel that way. Um, yeah. So how, how much well, you know? I'll tell you, or not? Oh, well, I'll tell you, tell you something that's, that's interesting though, because um, we used to have these parties at my other house and we had these big pythons in, you know, one, one of them was over 200 pounds. And I one. remember this, you know, people would come mostly people interested in reptiles, but sometimes they'd bring dates. And I remember this one woman, Oh my God. And she looked around and everybody's looking at her like she's weird because almost everybody else in the room was reptile people. And before we were done, she had the thing draped over her. And, oh, these are not so bad. I thought they were slimy and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But but she was expecting to, you know, get attention with everybody else supporting her. And when she found out she was the weird one of the group, she quickly converted. <laughs> or in, in my family, for instance, I was the, the weird snake collector. But once I made my first million, I became eccentric. <laughs> That's funny. I can't wait till I'm eccentric. <laughs> well, right? I'll, I'll tell you, you, you've heard probably the second million is easier to make than the first. Well, that is true. So give up on the first and start on the second one right away. I'm in. <laughs> we going, we two accident, bro, right now. <laughs> start at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, buddy. I'm there in. There you go. Hey, my hey, clock, doesn't, my or... clock doesn't have a 6 a.m. since I retired. Good on you. <laughs> hey, Bob, so Bob, I heard uh, I heard a story once of a guy. He went to a post office because his friend said, hey, can you pick up uh, an animal for me? And he gets to the post office and the lady hands him, you know, the, the package. And it's a, a tube that, you know, has a poster in it. And it looked like a poster. And the guy popped the top while he was still in the post office, and it was like some illegal snake. And he's like, "Oh, I can't," you know. But the lady in the post office like freaked out um, because I, I believe that that probably happened, but I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah, hypothetically, no, I had nothing to do with it. Now, we we used to send Gila monsters and stuff in PVC pipes with holes drilled in it uh, on the upper part, so if they crapped, they wouldn't drip through and put the plastic caps on the end and then tape them. But, you know, that's that's the way we would ship them so they couldn't claw through the bag or, you know, make a lot of noise or anything. And rattlesnakes, sometimes you, you didn't really want to tape the rattles because it was hard to get off. So if they weren't going too far, you just dip them in water and get them wet, and then they are very quiet and they won't be rattling in the box. Or sometimes you nestle them in a lot of material to where they can't shake them, you know, without being – covered with the material, but, but, um, nobody I know ever did that. <laughs> that's, that's how people used to do it through regular mail. Yeah. Or you could tape their mouth shut on the, you know, copperheads and stuff. Just put a little, in fact, a lot of the guys that do the animal training with the dogs and everything, they, they don't de-venomize them or anything. They just tape their mouth, you know, a little strip of a, a white, you know, medical tape, just tape their mouth shut and, and that way they can just untape it and they're fine. But after a while they get used to handling and they won't rattle or, you know, get defensive with the dog. So they got to get rid of them. And I, a lot of, a lot of these rattlesnakes I relocate, if they're big enough and nasty enough, I'll give them to the dog trainer guys with understanding that when he's done with them, he'll take them out and release them. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> so 
do you follow the modern day hobby? Like, do you know regulations that are happening? Do you know new laws, restrictions? Are you abreast of anything going on right now? Because there's a lot going on right now. Uh, I see the. I, I get the notices from the that group that you just put sur- you, support them. USR. Uh, USR. Yeah. Um, I, I get their notifications, but since I've been out of it for about three years, I haven't really paid that much attention to it. It's USR kind of disappointed me years ago because when they told me, I mean, back back in the early days, I had a permit for the Heel Monsters, and I was ordered to get rid of them or else. And so I got rid of them, but I applied for a permit, um, and I got the permit, and I had to go out and fill my quota again <laughs> with new ones because I had gotten rid of the old ones because I thought they were going to come confiscate them. But then years later, after I'm breeding them and producing them, and well, I had a, a zoo in, I think it was Switzerland or Belgium or someplace, was going to buy some of the babies. And I applied to, because the permit says, you know, you got to get their permission to sell them. Well, I applied to this guy who said, that's not really my job. Go to this guy, go to this guy. Well, after two years, uh, it got back to sending me to the first guy that said it wasn't his job. And so I got a hold of my congressman and they put some pressure on him. And all of a sudden I could sell to anybody I wanted as long as it was legal. But then years later, and I've got all this paperwork. And then years later, they tell me again, you know, we're going to make you illegal and you got a certain time to get rid of them. And so I went to U.S. Arc with all these papers and oh, yeah, we'll try to help you. And they read through them all, and they just said, well, that's the rule. There's nothing we can do. And I'm thinking, well, I thought that's what you were supposed to be doing. And I've been donating all this money and all this stuff to you for all these years, and that's the law is the best you can do. And so I haven't given anything to them since. But that's just one individual. I'm sure they're doing good in other categories. No, yeah, um, you know, can't hate them in any way. I mean, they always got a lot on their plate. Um, but, you know, I do remember, like, in the early days of the Burmese Pythons and the Lacey Act, um, you know, that was kind of the conversation, like, you guys can keep everything else, but we're going to lose the Burmese Pythons. And we were all like, well, the whole reason for U.S. Arc in the early days was to save the Burmese Pythons. And they're like, well, we're still going to have to give them up so we can keep everything else. <laughs> so it doesn't always work the way we want it. No, I hear you there. I hear you there. But yeah. No, it's getting very heavily regulated nowadays. Florida's really starting to enforce stuff. Uh, that's becoming a little bit of a shit show. New York is potentially. Well, remember remember years show. ago when the hybrids were the big thing? That, oh, yeah. I um, love, was it the wall? <laughs> well, you know, the whatever, you know, they breed kings and gophers and kings and rats and all that kind of stuff. And, and at that time, I, I, you know, you had the, the um, whatever you call the PETA people and everybody trying to get rid of all the animals, all the pets. And, and uh, I, I told several people back then, I said, you know, if these people end up passing laws where you can't keep anything that's wild or wild in nature, the only people that are ever going to have anything are the ones with the hybrids because no, because basically they're obviously domesticated because they don't exist in the wild. And that didn't happen way back then, but uh, the way the pressure is put on right now, it may come to pass. Hmm. It's kind of That's, scary. Oh, it is scary. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen all the ups and downs over the years in the hobby, but right now it just feels, it's pretty nonstop. If you go on your email and start reading the newsletters, it's about every day there's a new story, a new regulation. Um, Alabama passed laws pretty fast this past year, making... African software is illegal, Tegu is illegal, reticulated pythons, Burmese pythons. I don't know if anacondas were on that list. Um, South Carolina, I don't know if it's complete yet, but South Carolina just passed um, no more Tegus. <laughs> um, Georgia could follow. North Carolina could follow. Florida, how much did they just regulate in Florida? Like how many, like it's a pretty wide band of a lot of stuff. See, Florida, Florida to me is missing the boat because – They could issue a permit and say, hey, we got stuff from India, Africa, South America, everywhere. You pay this much money for a permit and you come down here and you catch anything you want or anything you've got a permit for. They could actually turn it into a commercial enterprise instead of trying to eliminate them, which they're not going to. I mean, any 
Mm -hmm. Anytime you got that much expansive, you know, natural terrain, you're not going to eliminate anything that's there. No. So why not, why not turn a profit for the state? Well, I do think that's actually something they're going to be encouraging because I think with the rules they put in place in 2024, you won't be allowed to breed tegus, um, Burmese pythons, iguanas, and 13 other species off the table. And now that they've passed this, they can add any species they want. Chameleons will probably make it on the list soon. They could put a leopard gecko on there if they want. But <laughs> what they are encouraging, though, and what I've heard is for people to start collecting more of the invasives to ship out of the state. So I think that's what well, I know they... There are, I believe there's a, a bounty on the Burmese pythons, if I'm not mistaken. They get paid by the foot or something? Yeah, I don't know how that pay grade works, but um, I do know they are paying collectors to go out there and catch them. And I, know, I don't know about iguanas, um, but no, they are doing stuff to encourage people. But at this point, the problem is so out of control that there's no fixing it. Um, Regulating our hobby more does not really fix a problem that's been going on for 20, 30 years. Now, yeah. see, I mean, back back in the old days, things were so cheap to import uh, that people like, you know, um, Crutchfield or um, any of the guys down there in Florida, they, they'd get a batch of bad animals. They just take them out back and dump them and reorder some more because things were that cheap. In fact, I, I, I'm not going to say any zoo actually did it, but I believe you could, and in those days, I could buy a cobra, put it on display, and not feed it and have it last for six, eight months and replace it with another cobra cheaper than feeding it for that period of time. And wow. so it, you know, it was kind of kind of hard to deal with that. So now, I, I, don't, I don't think any zoo did that. I hope they didn't. But then again, oh, in San Diego Zoo, they had a keeper there that that um, there was some confiscated Durango Mountain Kings, and he said he had one that wouldn't eat anything but lizards. And I said, well, how come it looks so bad? He says, well, we don't have lizards. And I said, well, why don't you give it to me, and I'll, you know, fatten it up and get it in my breed. No, we can't deal with private people. But years ago, they had a rattlesnake display that they said that uh, they've never seen a red diamond rattlesnake over five feet. Well, I caught one that was six foot one. So I thought, I'll take it down to the zoo and I'll just trade it to him for something. Well, we don't trade. Well, I thought you'd want this because it's a you know record size. Well, we'd like to have it, but we don't trade. I said, well, okay. And I put it back in the container I had and was getting ready to leave. I said, well, if you want to donate it, um, we can give you a couple rosy boas or something. I said, well, I thought you didn't trade. So, no, we're not trading, but if you donate it, we'll give you these. I said, well, okay, whatever you want to call it. So I took whatever it was they offered, figuring it was going to be on display. And, you know, my name catching the world record or whatever. They ended up offering it to some zoo in the Midwest or something. They didn't even hmm. keep it. But, I mean, that's, you know, the, you, you get so tired of dealing with these hypocrite type people that you just kind of... <laughs> Well, I, I could tell you some other stories, but it might get some people in trouble, so I won't. But like nobody's gonna listen to this. You can get anybody you want in trouble. Just... <laughs> yeah, no one listens to this show. You're not gonna get anybody in trouble. Okay. <laughs> well, I just I, I'm just remembering that. Well, the one story I can tell you is rather interesting because one of the guys that was a lot nicer uh, person that worked at a certain zoo nearby me. Um, he had to walk the line when he was at work, but he had a private collection of Gaboon Vipers in a garage and a tract home in a little town in the suburbs here. And he was so secretive about it that I didn't find out about it until I went to Philadelphia and talked to somebody that he was more open to out of state. Really? The guy that lives five miles from me has got that? <laughs> but we had, we had guys with Cobra collections in their in their uh, apartment building in the second bedroom. And I mean, the, you know, the fang freaks were very prominent out here for a while. We had one guy that worked for Scripps and got, uh, got fired, but he managed to steal a money order. So he went back to, the, I think it was the O'Keen, Oklahoma rattlesnake roundup and used the purchase order to pick up 2000 rattlesnakes. And 
I was heading back to San Diego to release him downtown, but he got caught along the way, so he never made it. But then there was a cobra that got loose in Claremont from a friend of mine. They never found that. Another guy I know released a copperhead in a water moccasin near a lake near me here. And uh, so, yeah, there's, you know, things that happen. <laughs> wow. I don't know what's there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I'm going to got to take a second. You, I had something else I want to bring up before I got completely sidetracked now. Um, do you, do you want to talk about a, maybe another country story that you've had or? Uh, not really. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Bob. I mean, there's, okay. There, there's not, I mean, you know, I, I've been through Canada, but you know, what do you find in Canada? Um, Garter snakes? Yeah. <laughs> I was just passing through because I went up to visit Glen Slimmer and decided to go across Canada and then drop back down in the United States. But, um, oh, let's see. I mean, most, most of my collecting has been in the United States. So I grew up reading uh, Snakes Keeper. I mean, not the Keeper and the Kept, the Snakes and Snake Hunting by Caulfield. And uh, I've been to almost all the places that he listed in his book and did pretty well. It did pretty well in the Pine Barrens. We got a couple of pine snakes, a corn snake, some hognose snakes, and three of the Eastern Kings. Uh, I think we got a ringneck snake or some other little snake too. That's back in the 70s, so I don't remember exactly. Uh, did some hunting in Florida, quite a bit of hunting in Arizona, California, Southern California, of course. Um, you know, I, I live within a few miles of what Clobber made famous with all of his road stories. And, um, talked to him on the phone, never actually met him. Met Clifford Pope. Uh, they were, he was supposed to come out here and autograph my books, but he had the nerve to die before he could make it. <clears throat> what was that? Is that oh, a time limit or something? Somebody saw right. No, that's, that's me. It's taken care of. It's over. Oh. We're good. <laughs> there was a call coming in. I, hmm. I put in the voicemail. <laughs> so but, um, I, I haven't done too much field collecting since I got heavy into this captive breeding. It sort of holds you prisoner because there's, there's almost always something that's stuck in the shed or hatching or needs feeding or needs breeding. Or, you know, I used to weigh and, um, you know, sex the babies. I was keeping track of how much each clutch of eggs would weigh compared to the weight of the female and, how many hatched and what the sex ratio was and got all sorts of data. In fact, Chris Madison, I don't know, he's from England, but I don't know if you read any of his books about snake breeding and everything, but he ended up staying with me. He and his girlfriend stayed with me for a couple of weeks and were Xeroxing off all of my records. And that's one or two of his books was mostly records off of my house, but wow. I still got a lot of records. It's just so far, nobody seems to want to pursue them because I'm not going to, sit here and copy 20 years worth of stuff. If you want the records, you come out and copy them. They're, they're years free, but you got to come get them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. There's tons of them. Well, you know, your comment you made before about the early days, um, what is it, Ron St. Pierre, when we were talking to him, he had mentioned back when he was younger, he would look in the Yellow Pages in Florida, and he would find... Um, importers that had gone out of business and he would go to those properties and start looking through those areas and find everything. Hmm. Um, like you said, back in the day, they were just dumping them out the back door. Um, yeah, so certainly yeah. a way to do it. Yeah. I, I would, of course, I've, I've always been out West here and we didn't really have that, but, but we used to look in the back of the field and stream for Thompson zoo or Clusen zoo or whatever. And Ray Singleton, and, um, you know, some of the original, guys. In fact, <laughs> Ray Singleton, before he went to jail for stealing bicycles, um, he shipped me a bunch of stuff, including six three-foot alligators. And <clears throat> this is back when they were fully protected. I, excuse me, hypothetically shipped them to a guy I know. <clears throat> so <laughs> in those days, you could drive onto the tarmac and pull up next to the airplane and unload your stuff right into your vehicle. Well, <clears throat> he had a a box of box turtles, a box of tortoises, boxes of water snakes, you know, in bags, corn snakes, indigos maybe. Um, 
<clears throat> and then he had these six alligators. <clears throat> well, they had their mouths taped shut. And I thought, well, I opened the box and they seemed pretty calm. So I untaped one and set it in the back of my van. I had about three or four of them untaped and just sitting in the back of the van. I had a couple of kids with me and it was like somebody blew a whistle and all of a sudden they all came alive, jumped out of the truck and were running under the airplane and under cars. And, and I had never handled a three foot alligator or even a one foot alligator. When you touch them, they come snapping around at you. And I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get all these things in the van without somebody noticing there's alligators running loose under the airplanes and calling some authority to arrest me. So that gave me the impetus to somehow get a hold of them. So I threw them all in the van and closed the door. So now the kids are in the back seat with their feet up and <laughs> before I put the bed and everything in the back. So I just had a metal floor of the E200 Ford wagon. So I'm driving home and they're all staying in the back. Well, actually, at that time, they were coming forward and the kids were using shirts and things to push them back. And there was this hitchhiker along the road in a sort of a cowboy outfit. And I just, my sense of humor got to him. I just had to pick him up. So I picked him up. He got up in the front seat and we're talking and uh, he's heading to some rodeo or something. I said, you ever, ever had anything to do with alligators? Because he was saying he's from, oh yeah, I used to wrestle them and all this stuff. And I'm just waiting for this damn alligator to, or at least one of them to come forward. And it didn't. And we're approaching where he wants out. So I'm going fairly fast and I hit the brakes. And sure enough, a couple of alligators slide forward. We hadn't even stopped. He opened the door and jumped out and I saw him rolling down the hill. I don't know where he went, but we just closed the door and kept going. I hope he wasn't hurt. He might still be laying there. I don't know, but, but, uh, <laughs> It was it was hard to see because my eyes were watering from that point home. But yeah. you sound like a tough guy to keep up with, buddy. Like <laughs> honestly, you're just like creating your own adventures. Things aren't good enough for you. You just throw a little more salt on it, a little more sugar, well, and get things a little crazy. Well, when we went down to Mexico, down to uh, San Blas <laughs> area, <clears throat> we hired this Mexican guy to take us off the tourist track to. Basically, we we're snaring iguanas and things and, you know, up to six foot long and and uh, saw some baby crocodiles. Now, hell, I can get $100 each for those things. And they were right near the shore and there was mostly jungle. But at this particular spot, it looked like, you know, there was pretty solid footing. So I had this butterfly net that, well, it was heavier than a butterfly net. But, then, you know, you get the picture. So I can't quite reach them. And so I figured, well, I'll just step into the creek. <clears throat> well, the creek didn't have a bottom. It was not a, you know, you step onto a little shallow thing. All of a sudden, I'm brown water over my head. And as I'm sinking, don't mama crocodiles take care of their babies? <laughs> you know? it, it was like I popped up on the surface and water walked and got back to the shore before <laughs> I even knew what was going on. But, but that, was, that was fun. We never did catch any crocodiles. But um, it was fun. So would you consider yourself the luckiest man that ever lived? Because I'm hearing a lot of close calls, man, and you seem to end up on top every time. Well, what do you mean close calls? Those weren't close. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounded close. Am I giving you too much credit on this one? It sounded pretty no, close the, to me. The close call was when I was coming back from Oklahoma with a box full of extremely rare uh, albino speckled kings and all that stuff because I bought the guy's collection and, and on breeding loan basically it was part buy and part breeding loan and I had those Nelson I was telling you about and I blew a tire and I, I'm somewhere outside of Tucson and I blew a tire I was doing about 70 miles an hour and I was passing somebody and it was you know two lane freeway and the truck spun around and then where the tire popped off, I guess, the, the metal rim hit. It spun me around a complete 180, even a little further. And then at a 45 degree angle, I flew off the freeway backwards and landed in a bank <clears throat> with my lights pointing up towards the freeway and my truck still running, but the keys had flopped out and were in the back someplace. And so I'm trying to figure out 
Well, first, as I was sliding off the freeway, I figured, I don't think this is going to kill me, but I think I'm going to wake up in a hospital somewhere. The guy I was passing comes running down the bank and he comes over to the door. I'm still looking for the keys. He comes running over to the door, says, are you okay? Are you okay? And the smart ass in me says, oh, yeah, I always park like this. And <laughs> he ran back up and got in his car and left. So now I'm by myself at about two in the morning um, <laughs> in between the freeway. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I fixed the tire and then I backed up and then I got the flashlight out and started clearing brush because there was a lower area where I thought I maybe could make it back up to the freeway. So I'm backing up and forth, back and forth, flattening stuff out. <clears throat> and then I'm looking to see if there's any lights coming on because I don't want to be popping up going in the wrong direction. And when it's pitch black, I hit the gas and go as fast as I can and then turn into the bank and just barely make it up to the freeway. So then I pull over to the opposite side and I'm thinking I should get under there and see if the gas tank's ruptured or see if there's any damage. Then I thought, well, shit, I'll drive a few miles and let the dirt and everything fall off and then I'll look. Then I thought, well, I made it this far. Uh, why stop? I just keep going. So I never even bothered to look. So that, that was a close call. That's what I would call a close call. This other stuff is just fun. <clears throat> um, I will say this with your stories. They don't build kids or cars like they used to, buddy. Like, ah. <laughs> uh. so, so we're just past two hours. We'll do a sanity check here. How, how are you feeling there, Bob? Well, actually, I'm thinking I should go get another drink, but <clears throat> Ed, but, uh, do you want to take care, brother? No, it's, <clears throat> I mean, no, <clears throat> nobody's gonna listen to all of this anyway at one setting so are we are we done do you think or <laughs> oh well mm. i think bob just said we peaked is that what i just got out of bob I, well i, I think two hours i mean I, I i was watching some of your podcasts or at least one of them a while back to get an idea of what i was in for and most of them go an hour and a half to two hours so i wasn't sure if you had a time slot that you try to fit them in uh we try <laughs> to fit it in people's attention spans and we find two hours is usually a Good attention span for people. Um, I was going to say, the people I know, it's about 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, well, they're not our demographic, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, was what? very entertaining, though. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I'd love to do another one of these at some point. I think we all need to have a drink next time. This this feels like a drinking podcast to me. In hey, the I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah. yeah so It's a wealth of crazy of stories, man. Yeah, we, oh, we can do a lot better with this. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different stories and, uh, you know, half of it is, you know, again, my memory is fading a little bit. I try to forget the bad stuff <clears throat> and there, there has been some bad stuff. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, I mean, Bob, I mean, you want to do this again sometime? I mean, I think, um, you know, I think a couple drinks next time. I'd love to just dive into some other random stuff, talk a lot more herping next time. I mean, I love herping, so I can oh, talk yeah. herping for hours. <clears throat> And if it, next time, if you're really nice, I'll tell you the story of how I was on trial by jury and ended up on the third floor of a courthouse with a gun, bullets, and a snake bag um, and trying to get out without getting stopped. But that's for another time. Uh, as long as you promise to come back on again, that's going to be the story. Wait, wait, wait. Start the sure. is, there, is there any way we can convince you to do that as the finale right now? <laughs> oh, no. you got to save something for the next time. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good entertainer. Uh, well, like I said, uh, two hours is about our attention span over here, so I think Bob's right. Um, you know, usually I'm the one who um, throws in the towel, but this time is the guest. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> don't, don't make it like I'm chicken out, but I am getting kind of hungry. <laughs> No, you deserve to eat it. We all have work to do, I'm sure. I got to get back to the shop. I left all the employees feeding snakes. I got to go make sure we're doing what we need to be doing. Um, well, honestly, um, I don't know, Ryan, you seem kind of peppy. I think you'll um, send us out today. How does that sound? Oh, it sounds like you always dodge that bullet. Or <laughs> signing out or signing in. So, sure. I, I'm, I'm Let's the middle. do it. Yeah, I'm the middle. You guys are the beginning and end. You are the stuffing of the sandwich. I'll give you that. <laughs> the meat. You're the meat. You're the fluff and utter, whatever you want. <laughs> you know? 
But I do want to thank you so much, Bob, for coming on, man. Like, we really appreciate you sharing the old school stories of what's going on in the, it's just like the history lesson of what all these newbies think they're joining on with the ball python thing. Like, this is where the bread and butter is. This is the good stuff. So we appreciate you, man. So thank you so much. Guys, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Check out Herp House Rock. Subscribe. We just passed 500 subscribers. Milestone, baby. Not bad. And Bob is the icing on the cake of that. So thank you so much. And we'll see you in the next one. Hey, appreciate you guys. Thanks thank a lot you, for Bob. having me. Oh, of course.